Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from across Canada to learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives and works there. We believe on this show, shockingly, that the best way to understand a community is to actually talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on to the show today. Please help me welcome Councillor Andrew Knack of the City of Edmonton of, in the province of Alberta. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So, Andrew, let's start with the million-dollar question. You are no exception to this million-dollar question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? So I've listened to the podcast a few times and, and I, I still feel like I was ready for that question, yet still not ready for that question. Um, but but I think back to, you know, as I was really young, my parents uh, would watch election results come in. So on election night, on the federal elections, on the provincial elections, we would gather around the TV like you would Stanley Cup finals, Super Bowl and, and it was like one of the few nights I was allowed to stay up late uh, because in their mind, this was very important and they wanted me to be uh, aware of what was happening. And, and I think that started it. And so I've always been following and engaged in politics. I actually never thought I would serve. Uh, it, it, was, it was back in uh, 2007 when I first decided to run. I was 23. I had just graduated from university. And... I was thinking about the upcoming municipal election. Uh, and because while I was engaged, I never thought I would run, but I always had to vote. I was always going to vote. And I was thinking about who am I going to vote for this election? And uh, at the time, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't very um, knowledgeable. Like I was fairly arrogant back when I was 23. I thought I knew everything. Uh, and 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 so I, I was thinking, oh, I don't feel super well represented. I hadn't been at city, but I had never stepped foot in city hall. So there's the arrogance, by the way. Like I thought I was I thought I knew everything. I had never even set foot in the building. Um, but so that was the bad reason I ran in 2007. But the good reason was is that I, I wasn't often seeing younger people represented at our city, uh, whether that be speaking to council at meetings or at the city council table. And I, I found out it took, you know, 100 bucks and 25 signatures to get your name on the ballot. And I thought to myself, like, what, what's the worst that happens? I get one vote. Uh, and so I gave hopefully it a try. yours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hopefully mine. <laughs> so I, I gave it a try. I lost horribly. But through that experience of actually knocking on doors and hearing people's stories and understanding the impact that local government can have on somebody's life. Uh, it, that changed everything. I went to school for business. I was going to have my own business. I was going to, you know, build this multi-million dollar business and live a lavish lifestyle. Like that was sort of the, the dream in my head. And I woke up the next morning after that 2007 election and everything changed. And I realized that even though I lost horribly, whatever I needed to do going forward in my life was, was focused on service towards others. And so it wasn't something that was like, uh, always sort of stewing over the years. I think it started there. It was in the back of my mind, but I, I woke up that next morning and realized something needed to, I needed to do something different. And it didn't even necessarily mean being an elected representative. It could have meant uh, greater volunteerism, working for a public organization that does great service for individuals. But that that was the changing moment in my life where where I kept going and I ran again in 2010 and I failed again and then finally got on in 2013. So uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to start by unpacking this question, because this is the semi-hypothesis of this entire series, is why do people get involved municipally? You could have chosen school board, you could have chosen provincial politics, you could have chosen federal politics, but municipal politics and municipal governments are the front line of governments that people deal with on the day-to-day -day basis as much as they may not think they do, they do. What was the decision for you to get involved in 2007 municipally? It it stemmed from uh, at at that time I was starting to feel a bit disenfranchised with partisan politics. Uh, I grew up really conservative. I am not, you know, I'm I feel like I'm more in the middle of the road somewhere now. 
Um, but as I became more aware of what was happening in that world, I was starting to see what, what I feel and, and I think has gotten worse uh, in my mind is this just immense loyalty to a party that no matter what, you have to be loyal to your party before you think about the broader public good. And, and that's not to say that people who are MLAs and MPs are not there to do good work for the people that they serve. But I think you see time and time again, examples of where it feels like people are, um, you know, put in front of a press conference to defend something that, that, gosh, like any other person would say, no, you can't defend that. Um, but but they have to because the party's doing it. Or there's a vote coming up that's really important. It might not be a budget vote, but it's still seemingly important. And either they have to show up and vote or, you know, if they're really opposed to it, they're they're able to sort of like be absent that day. I use air quotes. And and, and I am really frustrated with that system. It has it has to me uh, it, it is harming the trust in the institution of government. It is um, causing further just division because we are so loyal. People are like, people can't call out their own party. Like, they're so quick to say, well, what about when, you know, federally, you know, oh, well, what about when Trudeau did this if you call out Polyev? Or what about Polyev when you call out, you know, Trudeau? And it's like, can't, can't we just strive to have good governance regardless of who's in party? And I and I realize like I am naive. I am so, I, idealistic, but like it's it's exhausting to watch that system right now. And I see how well it functions municipally. And I want it, to, I want to keep doing this to help prove to people you can have that provincially and federally if you're just willing to to step outside your comfort zone a little bit and say, you know what, maybe I don't want to be part of the system anymore. I think you just hit the hammer on the head when it comes to why I, I shifted focus from provincial and federal politics to municipal, because you don't have to go through the party people to get interviews. You just have to go to the councillor's office. Um, but I want to ask this, because you bring up a good point here. Partisan pol politics is very divisive right now. Uh, people won't call things out. But as municipal councillors and as elected local elected leaders, your side may not always win on issues that you vote on, but you have to go out and sell a budget if you don't like it. You may say you might not like it, but people will ask you, how is this going to help me? So you have to go out and sell something that you may not fully agree with municipally. While partisan politics doesn't play a part in it, you still have to be one Edmonton, one city, one town, one village, whatever. How do you do that in your role as counselor, do you think? Because I can imagine it's challenging when your vote doesn't go the way that the majority goes and you still have to live with the consequences of what has just transpired at City Hall. Yes, but but it's not as hard as it as it might even sound. Truly, like I, I mean, this was the first time. Uh, this past December was the first time I I actually voted against the operating budget. I voted in favor of the capital budget. I didn't vote in favor of the operating budget. And it was hard. I mean, if you actually go listen to the to the meeting, I was like breaking up a little, I think because of like two weeks of exhaustion of budget meetings, but also just like, I, I felt in a way I was letting my colleagues down who had worked so hard uh, on that budget. And, and yet, you know, at the end of it, I, I voted against, I wrote a detailed blog saying, hey, I didn't support this, but also here's some good things that are still coming from it. And I and and the beauty of it is that rarely in municipal is, is there something so completely opposite of what people want. Like, you know, generally we're talking about um, being fairly aligned overall. Like if you look at our voting records uh, and there's usually in the city of Edmonton, uh, usually at least one journalist that does this once a year where they'll go look at our voting records on non-unanimous votes. And usually even the furthest level of opposition is, is that you might agree with somebody 50% of the time on non-unanimous votes, but it's very rare to see that percentage lower than that. And that's usually only one or two people. Uh, and so when you remind yourself of that, that, just on non-unanimous votes, you're still probably agreeing half the time. If you factored in the unanimous votes, you're probably agreeing 80 to 90% of the time. Um, 
And so that's how I, I handle that, is that I'm reminded of even those that I'm usually uh, might be on the opposite end of on certain issues. Like we agree on so much else, and I'm happy to not throw folks under the bus for that. I'm happy to speak up about why I, I was maybe on the opposing side in a respectful way, ideally in a factual way that isn't meant to create further division. Um, uh, but it's it's really easy compared to, I would say, what I witnessed from provincial or federal. I want to jump back to the 2007 campaign for a few minutes, and I want to talk to arrogant, and I'm using air quotes, arrogant, <laughs> Andrew, in your words here. Um, you learn a lot from defeat more than winning. And I want to know from you, what did you learn about yourself in that campaign? And what did you learn about the the political experience, uh, whether it be campaigning, whether it be learning about local issues that you took and you used towards your 2010 campaign? Because while you got defeated quite handedly in 2007, 2010, I believe you came second place. And then in 2013, you finally won. So each time you learned something about yourself and about your community, I'm assuming. What was the major takeaways about those first two campaigns that you can remember? I think the first thing on the on sort of the personal side was was a, a bit of a wake up call. And, you know, I know a lot of young people who are not arrogant, who are very who are very intelligent. I used to serve as the council rep on the city of Edmonton Youth Council, which represents which has 13 to 23 year olds who were light years ahead of me when I was 23. So I, I'm not going to use the broad brush that I think all young people are arrogant or, or just don't know a lot about the world. I think many do. I didn't. And I think that election was a was a good wake up for me to remind to, to tell me that um, you have a lot of learning to do. And if you're going to want to have any success in whatever you're doing going forward, you need to be willing to take a step back and really listen to people and really understand maybe what what people were saying with their vote and and ideally use that as an opportunity to grow and learn and and further yourself and so i use that as an opportunity to say hey maybe i should actually set foot in city hall and start attending these meetings hey maybe i should actually start going to my local community league meetings and learning what they're working on maybe i should and like i did uh, get involved with a major civic issue in the West End of Edmonton, which was the LRT construction. And, and I started advocating for something I believed in. And so that helped a lot from the, the personal growth side. And, and then I think on the just knowledge of campaign side, the other thing I learned is I decided to run, I think it was less than four months before the election, as somebody who, had, who knew no, nobody from the quote unquote establishment, who had never set foot in meetings, who had never been involved with community leagues, so just frankly, there was nowhere near enough time to go meet people so that they actually had any idea who I was. Um, and, and that helped me learn a lot more about what you need to do in a campaign, uh, particularly on the municipal side, because as you know, through many discussions you've had is that uh, it's a lot of, that's, I don't want to diminish the work of, of folks running for MLA or MP. They work hard and they do door knocking. But I think we we realize, and I think there's a lot of evidence that shows, unfortunately, folks aren't often voting for their local candidates first. They're usually voting for the party leader or the party first. And the local candidate can play a role, particularly in tight races, but not in the same way in municipal, where in municipal, at least in Alberta, where we have no parties, it is me. If you do not know me, if you have never met me, why would you even consider voting for me? It doesn't matter how good my website is. It doesn't matter how good my social media is. If you've never met me, chances are you're going to have a hard time saying, I'm going to vote for this person. And so I learned about the importance of getting out to community events, being present, speaking up about issues, knocking on doors, knocking on doors well in advance of an election uh, to try to get to as many people as possible. Uh, because at the time as well, I, again, didn't have the type of fundraising that was happening in most municipal elections in Edmonton and Calgary. And uh, you can substitute money for hard work and hitting doors, but you got to be able to put in a lot of time at those doors if you're going to substitute out the, the tens of thousands that are usually required to win an election in, uh, uh, in Edmonton and Calgary. So I'm going to push back a little bit, and I, I apologize. I just find this conversation so fascinating right now. 
you're right municipally it's not about policy sometimes it's not about the best website or the best sign it's about popularity who knows the who knows that candidate the most and you're right you have to get out and you have to go introduce yourself to people and then they can get a sense of who you are it's do you find that that is a beneficial um thing that voters have when they're looking at municipal candidates, because there's been talk in Alberta about bringing in political parties into the municipal realm, and that could take away that one-on-one -on -one connection and move to a more party vote compared to a more, who's the person I believe is the best person for this job, whether I may agree with them 100% or 50% of the time, I believe candidate X is going to be the best person instead of party Y is going to be the best party for the city yeah i i think uh, i am really worried about that push for for partisan and party politics even if it's not you know using air quotes conservative or liberal or new democrat parties municipally if it's the the vancouver style of of partisan politics that you're seeing it's it's one in the same and and i i think for some they see you know we have such low voter turnout i think because it is hard to get that information, to develop those connections. But I think if we think the solution is, you know, quote, unquote, I'll say it this way, is like dumbing it down and saying, okay, remove the need to actually have meaningful dialogue and say, hey, I'm just running under this party banner. And if they do a good enough marketing job, I'm going to get in there. Uh, I think, I, I, I truly still believe, even though voter turnout is as low as is, is municipally, people want to actually have meaningful dialogue. It is hard in municipal campaigns to reach as many people as you'd like, but I think people benefit more from that engagement. And, you know, I, I, I keep looking back to the fact that I have been fortunate the last two elections that I have ran for re-election that um, I've I've done, you know, forgive the lack of humility, I've done pretty well the last two municipal elections where I've got over two thirds of the vote. But that means people who are conservative and liberal and new Democrat have voted for me in re-election each of the last two elections to get that that level of support suggests that um, folks are willing to look beyond a party banner and say, I might not always agree. Gosh, I know there are people in that 66 <laughs> percent that do not agree with me a lot of the time that have told me to my face, I don't agree with a lot of what you're doing, but I like how you're doing it. I know how you're going to engage. I know how you're going to consider the information. And that is why I, I believe that you are the right person to serve in this role. And what a, what a great concept, which is the world that I think we need to exist in, in all orders of government um, and force people to not sort of, you know, right now, federally, all the liberals and the, and the conservatives care about is getting 36% of the vote because of that, they can probably get a majority and do anything they want. That is, that is frustrating. That is not what we should be striving for to say, how do we get 36% of the vote? You should be saying, how do I work to try to engage as many people as possible? Know that they, that they actually have a voice in the work that we're doing. I'd even take it one further. They say 36% of the vote in Ontario or Quebec. Exactly. Exactly. And, it, and I and I I'm not, I know we're talking municipally, but I would even say because this is going to be airing. This is our first episode in May that we're airing, and I can tell you, as we are in a probably a provincial election as of this airing, um, the focus will be on two cities. And I'm not trying to disrespect everyone else, but that does a disservice to the rest of Alberta when you're only focusing on two cities, whether it be Edmonton or Calgary. We have people living in other parts of this province as well, leaders. So get out and actually talk to but them. But here's mm. to that point, even I'll even go one further. They won't even care about Edmonton because Edmonton's going to vote orange. Yeah. A and it's interesting. I, I sit as uh, what are the city, one of the two council reps um, on Alberta municipalities, which is an organization that represents about 280 municipalities across Alberta. And um, I also, because of that role, I get to go and I try to go to um, the RMA meetings, the Rural Municipalities Association of Alberta. And I went to one in January. Uh, the District 5 meeting for RMA. And I, I remember sitting in on that meeting and listening to these rural leaders, these Reeves, um, oddly also feel like they're being neglected, right? They're being neglected in the reverse way of Edmonton. Edmonton's likely to vote orange, rural's likely to vote uh, blue. And both groups actually feel pretty neglected by, <laughs> by everyone because we've sort of written off both of those uh, places 
and it's all going to be Calgary. Um, and, and that says a bit about maybe our own roles and responsibilities as Albertans to saying, should we always be voting for the same party every time um, without asking them to do the work of, of proving what they're going to do? Uh, and that's hard, though, because we're sort of used to it. But but it also says, you know, and the parties know it. And, and I don't think they're going to meaningfully engage in either of those, two, either rural Alberta, small town Alberta, small city Alberta, or even Edmonton. It's going to be Calgary. And I, I think that's a darn shame. I want to talk about the 2013 election here because this is the election that you actually finally get that blue check mark, the coveted blue check mark on election night. It goes beside your name. Um, I want to know for you, what was that experience like finally after three kicks at the can? And I could imagine after the first two times, you probably went, okay, do I want to try a third time? If I go a third time, do I get defeated? And if I get defeated, do I look like the person who's just trying to get keep on going and going? So for you, A, what was the decision based on getting into that election in 2013? And what was the feeling like getting that blue check mark after so long waiting mm-hmm. for it? Uh, I, I won't talk about that 2007 campaign being arrogant, yeah. Andrew, but that 2010, when you actually learned, you went, okay, I want to do it again. I knew I was going to run in the 2013 election as the 2010 results came in, because what I ended up seeing pretty much the, that night and then the morning after was that A, I did come second in the ward I was running in, B, when I tallied up the total number of votes, so of all of the folks that had ran run for city council across all of 12 wards, I had received, I think it was the 14th highest vote total of the 50 candidates running. And that vote total was enough to, to be elected at least in one other ward. And I, and I looked at that and said, I actually can do this. But I realized that similar to 2007, while I had put in more time door knocking, it wasn't enough. And so what I said is that if I'm going to do this in 2013, and I was confident that I was going to, I'm going to door knock for at least a full year in advance at every single day possible that I can. And as I got closer to 2013, I made the, I started saving up money so that I could quit my job four months before the election and go all in. This was this was my last kick at the can. I, because I think you can run three times before you be, potentially become associated with losing. Uh, and and so I and I mean there have there are maybe some outliers to that, but I. I so I what think, you're saying, Andrew, is I have one more kick at the can. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like there's like you know if you've done three and you lost three times, uh, unless you're making really good progress each time. <laughs> Sooner or later, people will be like, well, wait a second, isn't this guy who always runs and loses? Um, and, and and so I said, OK, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to go in for a full year. I started door knocking a year before the election. I, I was still working full time right at the beginning of that, but I was going two days a week full time. And then uh, I worked retail. So I was either going morning or evening, depending on what my my shift was at work. And then I quit my job four months before the election. I went all in seven days a week, hitting the doors, hit 25,000 plus doors in the ward, um, which was every door at least, uh, uh, almost every door twice and some even three or four times. And so when I finally saw the results as as we got close to that election, and it was interesting because I went through a range of emotions, I was expecting a two-person race in 2013 myself and the incumbent because I had put my name in well in advance. I put my flag in the ground. People had known me by that point and said, okay, if you're looking for an alternative, I'm going to be your alternative. Uh, And I didn't want anyone else to run. So I was out there early and often. Uh, And then seven weeks before the election, this is after the incumbent had originally announced that that she was running for re-election. Uh, about a month later, two months later, but it was seven weeks before the election, she changed her mind and decided to retire, which actually threw off everything. Cause I'm like, and some people are like, oh, Andrew's going to be a shoe in, but I'm like, no, no, that, because this was a known unknown election. Like this is, you know, your two, your two choices. And that within an hour of her announcing her retirement, somebody who was running in the neighboring ward switched to the ward I was running in. And then within a week, four other names had gone in. And then suddenly I was in a race that was full of six unknown people. And I actually was terrified because I'm like, I built a campaign to try to to get elected with an incumbent. And now I had to plan a different campaign. And so uh, I kept overanalyzing everything every single day. And then finally, when the election results came in and, and the first polls came in and I was looking like it was quite a sizable margin, 
um, you, there was a combination of of both relief and melt, but but more importantly, just this immense joy of like knowing that what you've committed your time and effort to for years and years and years uh, was was recognized by those you seek to, uh, you're seeking to serve, and they have said, "We trust you. We want to give you this opportunity to serve us." And like it's, and I know it's cliche, but it's gosh, it's like just this greatest honor you could ever imagine to have that chance to serve someone. You've served three terms now, once elected, twice reelected. You ran in 2010, came second place. So you've seen candidates come and go. We are now heading into the second half of this term for a lot of Alberta councillors and mayors right now. Um, is this the time, and I'm, over, I'm generalizing here, is this the time when you start seeing people show up to council who are seriously interested in running the next election? Or are you? do you usually see them probably a year out from the next election, so potentially 2024? And I'm generalizing here because you're right. In larger areas, it's harder to make an impact such with a uh, small election period. So those who are potentially thinking about running next election – are getting involved now, whether they're applying for boards, whether they're meeting at local community groups. For you, do you start seeing sort of the jockeying starting now, or are we too far out from uh, election day still? We're we're still a little far out, but but you can also see it, uh, see it a bit. So those who are generally serious and are a little more well prepared than say when I was when I first ran. <laughs> um, they know that they do need to make their presence known a little bit. They need to, do need to be meeting with folks and getting out there. And even if they don't specifically say they're running yet, they, they want to make sure that um, they're not going to be in a complete unknown name. Uh, I, I mean, this last election in Edmonton sort of threw everyone for a loop because we had a lot of first time uh, candidates uh, get elected and four incumbents uh, defeated, which is exceptionally rare. And so they sort of uh, <laughs> that it feels like that was still the exception to the rule because that's that's a rare circumstance. But maybe it also shows that um, that you don't always have to do it exactly as the way you, you would think. Um, yeah. And a number of and, and the last election was a very weird election to begin with as well because of COVID nineteen completely changed the name for municipalities on how they interact it with residents as well. Exactly. And and so, you know, I don't know if we can use 2021 yet <laughs> as a model for, for other candidates thinking about wanting to run. I would still defer back to, if you're thinking of running, this is the, like, it is time for you to start doing the work. It is time for you to start meeting with folks. It is time to start building up your team. Even if you're not hitting doors until another year, year and a half from now, which gives you a year out before the election, um, you need to start doing the work now. And that's something I learned from 2007 to 2010 to 2013 about how much time you still want to be putting in uh, in between, because I, I, I have seen candidates run multiple times who seem to only come out a few months before the election. And I, I think that's not often been successful. And I think people start to recognize that. If Again, back to that point, if you see the same name over and over again, and you only see them a few months before the election and not in the community doing the work day in and day out, you know, people can sort of see through whether you're being genuine or not. And, and so it is important to, to meaningfully be involved in your community well before you start officially running for council. I want to ask one last question in this segment before we turn to the next segment, and that is the role of the council and role as counselor. You have a lot of information that is presented to you every single week, every single council meeting. You have to be knowledgeable on a lot of different issues. How much weight and responsibility do you put on your shoulders to go when you go into that council uh, chambers? You're making the best decision, not only for your ward, but for your city as well, because while you're elected as, as a ward representative, you are there to move the city forward. How much weight is put on your shoulders by you every time you go into that council chamber's room? A lot, <laughs> but, but <laughs> I, I would hope I, I, I see that in almost every uh, municipal elected representative that, that I meet with. Um, you know, we probably put more than we should on our shoulders, but 
but you also, you know, I'm so glad that there are people who are truly committed to the work that they do in each, each and every day. Um, and, and again, I'm going to go back to having have now have the chance to serve on this on Alberta municipalities and, and getting to go to, to small villages and small cities and meet the councillors and mayors who, I mean, you know, they, they say they work part time or, or the job is officially defined as part time. It's not. These folks put so much on their shoulders. Like, I mean, I at least get paid, at least in Edmonton and Calgary and a couple of other cities in this province. Like, I get paid a really good salary and and I am happy to commit the level of time that I need to to make sure I'm making good decisions. And I'm happy to put that weight on my shoulders. But gosh, the people who are working, the councillors and the Reeves and the mayors who are working in these small villages and small towns um, who... I, I what I can't understand is how they do it, because honestly, they work so hard. They put in way more time than they ever get paid for. And they truly do care about the work that they're doing each and every day. Like those are the folks that that we need to be applauding and rewarding because that like I, I think counselors across uh, across this province and across this country are severely underpaid for the amount of time. And I'm not talking Edmonton and Calgary counselors. I'm talking about small town counselors who are doing the work and they deserve way more than they get. And and but it is hard. So so broader to that question is that. You put a lot of weight because you know that every decision you make, no matter how good it is, no matter if it's free ice cream for everyone, you know, the person who's lactose intolerant is going to be like, what are you doing? And and like somebody's going to be potentially either negatively impacted or feel like they're negatively impacted by your decision, even if it seems like the best decision in the world. And you have so, to remind yourself of that. It's hard. How do you deal with that? Because you're right. Every decision you make is not going to please 100% of the people. Shockingly, you're not going to please everyone. Correct. I'm pretty <laughs> sure we're going to break some barriers here by saying that, but <laughs> not everything you vote on is going to be pleasing everyone. And at the same time, not every budgetary issue is going to affect your ward. There is going to be areas in your city that are going to be more impacted by a budget or a, a policy than your area. But you still have to make the decision and you still have to go tell your people why you've decided to vote the way you have. How do you deal with criticism and how do you deal with people who want to talk to you but want to talk to you about why you chose to vote a certain way? Because communications is great, but respect is also important. And, and this goes back a little bit to what I mentioned near the top is that as somebody that grew up really conservative and now finds myself, depending on the issue, either on the you know, left, far left side, sometimes in the center, sometimes on the right, um, that has helped me when it comes to that engagement, especially now when we're dealing with, with what feels like some of the most divisive times I've ever been a part of, is that I... I can still understand a perspective somebody from coming someone coming from one end of the spectrum or the other. And I genuinely do want to take the time to talk to everyone. I, I think we we do ourselves a disservice. Uh, again, and I'm gonna separate out. There's one or two percent of people who are are hateful people who do vocal not minority, I call them. Right. <laughs> the the very very vocal, very small minority who are folks that want to not have equal rights, who are doing so those folks you don't give the time of day to, but there's folks particularly now, and I mean, I even watched, you know, uh, with, with what's happening in federal and provincial politics of how it feels, particularly on, on the right side of the spectrum as somebody who grew up there, there are folks who are sort of further on the right, but aren't, they, they don't come at it from a place of malice. They come at it from a place of feeling ignored, feeling like they can't trust things and, and genuinely have those feelings and, and you can't dismiss them right off the bat. Like you might say, like when I have somebody who wants to with the vaccines or anything like that, and I'm obviously pro science and I believe <laughs> in them, it's it could be easy for me to say to somebody who didn't believe in vaccines, well, no, the science says yes, get lost. I don't want to talk to you. You have to actually remind yourself that the more you push somebody away like that, or the more you are dismissive of somebody like that, the more you're just pushing them into an echo chamber that they will never get out of. And, and so to your question, 
about when somebody wants to be critical, you have to remind yourself that no matter what you're dealing with, no matter the issue, whether it's bike lanes in Edmonton, which folks love to talk about, or land use or anything like that, um, even if you believe strongly in what you do, you've got to take the time to understand where that might anger or potentially fear comes from, from somebody who might be on the other end of the spectrum. Genuinely listen to them first before you start trying to fact check somebody to death. Because that's not going to win you any arguments. That's not going to change hearts and minds. You got to understand their fears. See what see what's at the underlying cause of what, why they've reached out to you in the first place. And then try to use that to help bring in new information that maybe they hadn't thought about before to help them see something in a different way. And then maybe also keep yourself open-minded enough that you might hear something and think, well, wait a second. I actually really hadn't considered it with that lens. Uh, I might have to rethink how I looked at this issue too. Okay. I was not going to ask this question, but I feel like you're up for it, uh, it. A- Andrew. Um, in- misinformation in today's age is high. Yes. Um, there is a big topic that is going through a lot of municipalities in Alberta right now. And we jokingly, I, I, I've jokingly, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I know about. what's coming <laughs> Um, we have been talking about 15 minute cities a lot lately over the last few weeks in my interviews with not only small town councillors, but large urban councillors, not here in Alberta, but also across this great country. In Edmonton, though, it seems to have taken a fever pitch. And I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but I kind of want to. How do you battle back against misinformation that is being spread via social media, via uh, uh, blogs, via news organizations? As a counselor, you try to battle back against it, but at the end of the day, you're fighting a losing battle, and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, but you are. How do you do it? (laughs) I think you do it in the same way you try to tackle other issues. And again, there's I, I need to separate out Take 15 minute cities, which I I uh, um, I got a lot of attention on uh, uh, <laughs> a couple months ago. I, I'm 90 uh, percent sure 90 percent of my listeners have just tuned out because we've talked about COVID and now 15 minute city. <laughs> but you know, I I think about that issue, and I think about how what I what I learned through a lot of phone calls because I got a lot of phone calls when I did my 30 second TikTok video on it and it got shared far and wide. Um, got a lot of people who called me, got a lot of people who emailed me and the way I, fir- even now I'm still learning. Cause I think when I first approached that, like I was seeing like guys like Brett Wilson tweet about it and I was trying to reply back in a, um, like saying, Hey, this is a conspiracy theory. Don't listen to it. And, and I realized that that again was a bit more dismissive than I needed to be. Because let's separate out those who are peddling the fear and division, which is a small percentage of people, versus those that those that have consumed it because they have been caught up in, you know, that's where they found community. And they have not, in the last couple of years, that's the only community they've had. And so when I actually took the time to call these folks back, and that most of these were hour-long calls. And you start to understand where are you coming from, what's happening, what what are you feeling, how are you, you know, what what's going on in your day to day life. You know, you you understand that there is a deep seated fear in this group. It is still a smaller minority, but they are vocal and they are scared, and they feel like nobody wants to take the time to listen to them. And I started to call everyone that called me back. I started to sit down with anyone who was willing to meet with me who had who was upset about the idea of a 15 minute city and we would talk through it and and I will say yeah at the end of most of those hour long conversations I don't think I necessarily you know got those people to come over to the side and realize that all we're talking about is land use and having different more choices around your home which to a wide majority of people, they know that's what this is all about. It's not about the restriction of movement of people. There's nothing in our policies that suggests that. But again, I didn't want to take that dismissive, you're wrong, here's why you're wrong, get lost. As I started to really dig into that and understand it, it's truly that many of these folks have just not been exposed to any type of other perspectives in the last few years because there weren't community events happening. And so they found it on their Facebook page 
with this groups, with these groups that, that again, the people that run these pages, they're the ones that I don't care about because they're peddling fear and division and they know it. But what if and, they're your residents though? And I apologize, but sometimes they, but, those people who are running these organizations are your residents and you, while you may dismiss them and say, I don't care about them, they still are voters and you still have to care about their wants and needs. Do you not? Not, not that very, very small percentage of okay. people are knowingly going out of their way. There is one residence in the ward that I represent that runs a very active Facebook page that went as far as asking for my address so they could come to my home. You know, people like that, that small, like I'm talking 0.0001% of people who are actually actively, and they know it. They don't get they don't get our time and they should never get our time. But we should take the time to engage those who are on those pages because they are only hearing that one perspective right now. That is the only community they have, they have found in years in the last few years. And you need to give those folks a chance to know that they're actually going to be heard by other perspectives and that you can understand that and you can try to talk through that. And so, um, and it has been really meaningful over the last two months since this got started for me to have a lot of chats with folks who are who are genuinely scared that this is going to lead towards the restriction of their rights or the restrictions of movements. And once you could talk, understand the fear, talk about that fear, and then shift a little bit into how land use works, it was a very different story than just starting the conversation of that's not how land use works, you're wrong, here's how land use works. That, that doesn't get you where you need to. I found a lot of people, by the end of the conversation, I said, I don't need you to trust me today. But what I want you to do is take the time to go read the documents that we've now talked about. And if you see anything in those documents that suggests that your rights would be restricted, please reach out because we haven't approved them yet. We're going a massive overhaul of our zoning bylaw right now. And I have yet to have a single person where I've had that conversation and put in that ask, come back to me and say, Oh, you know what, Andrew, this is actually, you know, that that first step in the direction of restricting my rights, because once they understood that I actually cared about their fear and we talked through it before asking them to do that task, that's why I think we've got more buy in. So it's time consuming, but you got to do it. And, and yes, people say, but that's five percent of the population. It's probably 20 or 25 percent in some smaller municipalities in Edmonton. It might be two or three percent, but that's still a lot of people. And and back to this back to the or one of our very original points why I dislike partisan politics is that it seems like we are unwilling to listen to the other side at all. You got to be willing, even if it's five percent of the people who feel that way. You got to be willing to take some time, help them understand, help yourself understand where their fear comes from, and and work forward on that together. And it's and it's hard, but it's it's and that's the beauty of municipal politics is because we can do that and we have the time to do it and we have the opportunity to do it. Okay, I, I know at the beginning of this, in our pre-interview, I said 45 minutes, and we have just hit the 45 minutes mark, and I haven't even asked you segment two yet. Do you have 10 minutes that we can chat? I do, about? of course. Okay, okay. Um, so I want to turn to segment two, and before I say uh, ask the question, I'm going to preface this because we always get emails. It seems like this is a weird topic that people really are passionate about, but this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is his opinion. Shockingly, for some reason, people don't understand opinions. Oh, I'm going to get attacked for that. <laughs> Anyway, so, Councillor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Edmonton today? I think the biggest issue right now today at the time of recording is um, a broader conversation about community safety and well-being. There have been legitimate safety issues in our city. There is also... Uh, and, and while it is not widespread, and I do not believe the stats would actually suggest Edmonton is a, is a dangerous city to live in, there is a strong feeling based off what has been happening that, that folks are unsafe. And this ties a little bit into the well-being part in that we have a massive housing issue, um, safety issue for folks experiencing homelessness and folks experiencing uh, mental health challenges and addictions. And while that is all provincial jurisdiction, the impact is felt almost exclusively by the city. And so these are coming together a little bit and sometimes being conflated with one another, 
But that is a big issue we are dealing with today at the time of recording that that um, I think needs uh, a pretty significant change over the next uh, next little while because it's folks are feeling a little bit worried. So what's the first step that the city and yourself could be taking to start this conversation? Because I always tell people the hardest part of any journey is that first step, that first step of actually sitting down and doing it. So for you, what do you see as the biggest step that needs to be done to potentially start this ball moving down the road to make people safe in their own communities? So I think we already started it, but I think that this leads to answer your question, because we put a year ago, we put out a detailed plan around how we need to address safety in our downtown core and transit safety. We've started actioning a number of those things, but it's not producing the results people expect. But on top of that, I also don't think we're doing this is one of the times where I think we're doing an abysmal job communicating with Edmontonians right now the the. There are sort of fringe groups that are sharing every bad example of something going wrong. And the city of Edmonton as an organization is not doing anything to try to show the broader majority of Edmontonians what actions have we been taking? How have they been working? How have they not been working? Why haven't some of those things been working? I actually think for an issue this serious, I think we need to be out in front of the public, whether it's the mayor, whether it's our city manager, once a week, we need to be out in front of the public saying, here's what we're working on. Here's the successes we've had in the last week. Here's the failures we've had in the last week. Here's what we're going to do next week. And, and we want you to know we take this extremely seriously because I think our actions prove we do, but people don't see it right now. And, and that's the next step in this is that we have a lot of work to do to actually, and, and frankly, at the time of recording this, you know, in the last few days, we've had the premier um, talk about how, you know, essentially we're a, a desolate wasteland in the cities of Calgary and Edmonton. And I think that hyperbole is really harming our um, that that conversation. Like, yes, safety and security is important. Let's have a meaningful dialogue with the order of government that can help resolve every aspect of this, because the municipality is responsible for the policing side. The province is responsible for the well-being side. And you know, I, I have not hid my my frustration that we are nowhere near where we need to be on the well-being side uh, and have not been for as long as I've been a councillor, if not longer. So we are in the midst of a provincial election then. What are you hoping to hear from the provincial leaders when it comes to this issue? Because uh, I can imagine you're right when we go throw back to an earlier statement, this election is going to be won and fought in uh, uh, Calgary. And while it's your sister city in some sense, it is a the other large urban center in the province of Alberta. The issues that are happening in Calgary and Edmonton, while different, they're similar as well. So what are you hoping that you're hearing from from the provincial leaders to help work hand in hand with yourself as councillor and council to address this well-being aspect of this uh, this issue that you're facing. You know, where I want to give the provincial government credits right now is they've spent a lot of time and resources on addictions recovery beds, addictions treatment beds, and, uh, and done a lot over the last four years on that. The problem is that is one piece of the entire spectrum of solutions that you need because uh, it's great if you can get folks into an addictions treatment bed, but if they finish their treatment and they don't have a place where they have housing and supportive housing where they have 24 seven support, some folks will relapse because addictions is, an, is, a, is a very challenging illness to deal with. Um, so what I want to see from both parties, and, and I've started to see a bit of it, um, uh, uh, the NDP just in, in a recent conference announced how much they want to invest in housing and how many units of housing they want to build. That's encouraging. Uh, but we need a clear plan from both parties in their platforms, in writing, that they are going to fund the construction of 24-7 supportive housing units, not just in Edmonton and Calgary. We are seeing it in mid-sized cities. We're seeing it across this province. But it's not just housing. It's appropriate shelter spaces. The city of Edmonton developed minimum shelter standards uh, about a year and a half ago, but we can't implement them. The province can require it. And, and Kenny, to Premier, former Premier Kenny, actually said we need to adopt these, but we haven't seen the funding associated so that shelter providers can do that work. We have a shortage of, of shelter spaces. We're a thousand shelter beds behind the city of Calgary, and we have the same number of unhoused people between the two cities. Uh, that discrepancy is huge. 
How do you battle back against NIMBYism, though? Because I can imagine building shelters is a great solution. No one ever wants to say, let's put a shelter in my backyard, or no one wants to see a, 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 a homeless community be rehoused into their neighborhood. Not saying not everyone. There are There's a lot of people who say, yes, let's help this, uh, this uh, population out. But there's a lot of NIMBYism. And we find that there's a lot of NIMBYism in the larger urban centers. While it's more prominent, in smaller sections because it is a very tight-knit group for communities like Edmonton Calgary it's a lot harder to say hey I'm I'm in my ward I'm the counselor for my ward I'm I'm willing to put this shelter in my my ward uh because I believe it would be the best served in that area 10 years ago there was a uh, affordable housing development that was going to be built on a church site in southwest Edmonton that was ultimately stopped because of um um community pushback at that point in time, and I wasn't a counselor just at that point in time, but but that started a major shift, oddly, in the other direction, because I think people realized that if we truly mean what we say, that we care about this, that we believe we are all in this together and that we have to work on this together, um, there has been a groundswell of support across this city in almost every community, actually, of folks asking for affordable housing. Because the problem is right now in Edmonton is that our neighbors, our houseless neighbors, are still living in the same communities. They are in the parks. They are behind businesses in places where they are less safe and are not getting the care and support. And so that is less desirable than having a well-run 24-7 supportive housing development where people will get the care and support they need at all times. And actually, we have gone... so. It started with Mayor Iveson, I would say, and he really took the leadership on this and pushed the entire Edmonton community to understand why we are all doing this while every community is doing this. The business communities got behind it. The obviously the broader community leagues got behind it. And yeah, while we have occasional pockets, even in the last ones we approved in 2020, because we decided to build a, a supportive housing because we couldn't keep waiting on the province. In the communities, in the five communities we approved them in, Almost every one of them it fully embraced them. And even the one community where there was a little bit of pushback, you saw at least as much pushback, if not more, from the local residents in that neighborhood saying, no, no, we're not going to be that community. We're going to be the community that embraces this. And, and so I think Edmonton is truly leading the way in this. We all get it. And we've seen the success of supportive housing. So Ambrose Place in, in our downtown core uh, has been the gold standard, and it helps reduce uh, calls uh, for health care service. It helped reduce provincial health care costs. It helped reduce policing costs because those who have been struggling, they're getting the care they need, and police haven't needed to be called out for, for uh, mental distress. Uh, and so we have the results to back up why we are pushing so hard on this. And actually, truly, I am not, I, I've got, I've talked about this in every community I represent. I'm saying we, every one of us is going to be a part of this and and while there might be some that it's not even a vocal minority that it just might be a minority who doesn't even feel like they need to speak up anymore because they know they are outnumbered by the edmontonians who know what we need to do i want to turn to our last segment here and i this is my favorite segment i love this segment because i love spending my economic dollars here in canada i know like a lot of people like to go to mexico but for some strange reason i like to visit communities in canada um I, I, we know the big staples of Edmonton. We know the West Edmonton Mall. We know White Ave. But what are the hidden gems in your community, and particularly your ward, that you would say, as a tourist, you need to come visit X, Y, and Z because you will learn so much and be so enthralled by what we have to offer? What are the hidden gems in your community? You know, I, I think uh, the first thing I would I would jump on is is Stony Plain Road in the ward I represent. It's, it is a main street that is still, we are still working on it. We're still working and, and advancing it. There's been a lot of great work though over the last few years by the businesses along Stony Plain Road. It's a, it's also a construction zone because we got an LRT coming down Stony Plain Road. So in a few years, it's going to be an awesome place uh, without any construction. Right now it's an awesome place with construction, but there are such cool local shops along Stony Plain Road. And, and Stony Plain Road's not trying to be the White Ave, another White Ave. They're not trying to be another 124th Street in Edmonton. They're trying to be their own thing. 
And, and I think the, the potential is there. We're seeing the, the community start to get further and further, more and more behind it. And I, I think it's going to become uh, a destination point in a few years. Once LRT is done and people see those construction fences come down, uh, it's going to be a huge draw in the city. But I think don't sleep on it now because you can go there. I mean, gosh, we got the best, com and I'm not just exaggerating this, they, like they won an award on the best comic book shop in all of Canada uh, in Variant Edition. We've got a couple of great bike shops. We've got good bakeries and cafes uh, and, and almost all of them local spots that are are phenomenal. And so it's a, it's a great destination, even though, yeah, we got a lot of construction. So that'd be probably one of the best places I would highlight in the ward. And then I mean, cheating answer because most of the most of the twelve wards in the city of Edmonton border on the River Valley, but you know we do also border onto the River Valley, <laughs> and, and of course it's not a hidden gem, but but still a place that for those that you know you don't even need to go into the River Valley. Communities along the River Valley often have these beautiful viewpoints where they are little gems because usually only the local community knows there's that viewpoint, and and they just have some spectacular places to where you can sit down on a bench and view this, this vast, gorgeous landscape. And you're not even in the, the thick of the river valley. So if you want to, if you want to escape the busyness of the river valley and still enjoy the beauty of it, those are some places you can do every everywhere. What about yourself? Where do you go to just decompress and get away from it all after a stressful day? And no, you can't say your own house or your <laughs> backyard. Seems like a lot of mayors and councillors want to say that. I'm joking, though. You can if you want. But where do you go to decompress in the town, the city? Besides besides my home. And I, I don't even have I, I don't have a backyard. I live in a condo. I'm in a 700 square foot condo. So I got a little balcony that I can go out <laughs> onto. But, uh, but truly, the place I go... Um, uh, before the 2021 election uh, or after the 2021 election, the boundaries changed by a few blocks. So the spot I go to is actually just technically outside the boundaries of the ward now, five blocks out, but it's the Jasper Place Library. It is, uh, Edmonton is fortunate to have, and again, I'm not exaggerating because we won awards on it, the best library system in the world. Uh, we won it in 2014. And, and I think Edmonton continues to show what libraries can actually be because when i moved into edmonton in 2002 i lived literally across the street from the library i, I was actually in the same parking lot as the library uh, -huh. uh and i never went because i i was so used to libraries being the spot where you go and you gotta be quiet and you gotta you know just do your research and then you get out and then finally i i was convinced to go in and uh and then I realized, oh, like not only do they not just have books and they have, you know, movies and they have music and they have and it, they were treating it as a community hub where you go and like engage and kids were out there laughing and engaging with each other. And and you've seen even in the last sort of 10, 15 years, the transformation of, of a EPL in the city. They have maker spaces where you can go create music and movies and games and where you can go create, you know, build things. We've got woodworking shops in the libraries. We've got seed libraries. We've got a commercial kitchen in the downtown branch. Our library system is is blowing the world away in terms of showing what a public space and we have it's completely free. And as most libraries are moving to completely free membership the last truly public place. I love going there once a week. I go to my library. I live across the street from it still. I just moved close by. And that's where I go to, um, to, to just experience the beauty of Edmonton because I can go get access to free information. I can see community coming together in a space. The building is, is I first thought I hated the design and it, it's grown on to be this unique design that I just love and show. And, and the fact that we invested in in the beauty of a building too to say this is something we believe in it's not just going to be a rectangular box where you come and get your books this is a place where everyone can come to gather and be be together as a community and so i love it as a place for me to decompress and for me to just experience what what is so great about our city so you've kind of stolen my next question and my last question. And this is the million that I said, the million dollar question was at the beginning. Well, the second million dollar questions at the end, and you can take as long as you want to answer this question or as short as time as you want to answer this question. In your opinion, counselor, Andrew, what is, what makes the city of Edmonton such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Mm. 
Yeah, I could I could just say the library because I think it's 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 a perfect uh, example of what we of what this city is all about. And, and and you know what I am going to just stick with that because I I think what what the library shows is that you know we have this uh, sign on one of the buildings take a risk it's the most Edmonton thing you can do and sometimes people use it to mock our city and sometimes people use it to actually talk about what we do well. But I think I, I think it's in this case I'm going to use it as the what we do well because. They took a risk on building out these maker spaces, on having speaker series, on having different ways. You know, they they led the way of saying we want free memberships because everyone should have access to this space. And they came forward to council and said, we want you to invest money to make free memberships. And we made it free and memberships soared because now we removed the barrier to access. They brought in different types of materials from ebooks to video games to music to movies. Um, you can get anything and everything you want. The people that run the programs and the type of programs they run are, are uh, you, you see that now spread out to libraries across this country. And more and more people are taking from the model of what Edmonton's been doing. And these were all risks that they took to try to reinvent how people uh, access public information and how they build community. And I think it is just the perfect example of what this city has done well for so long if if and and time and year after year and decade after decade Edmontonians just embrace our library system and and i and i and i truly don't believe i'm exaggerating when i think we have shaped how libraries operate across for sure north america if not the world and that's because of a willingness to take chances and uh and i just love to see what they've been able to create Andrew, I want to thank you. I want to actually thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time. I know we said 45 minutes, but taking an hour out of your day and doing this. Um, I often say this, but I, I mean it every single time I say it. Um, our communities are better served with counselors like you at the table. Uh, you seem to have a passion for your community and we need more people like you at the council table. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for sitting down with me today. My pleasure. Thank you for thank you for showcasing and highlighting all this. I love <laughs> listening to the stories about municipal leaders across the country. It's really cool to hear that. And I'm so glad it's not just big cities that you're connecting with. It's small towns, it's small villages, because everyone has such incredible stories and our communities are so different. So thank you for the work you're doing and highlighting it. Well, thank you. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 10 minutes a day. Go have a conversation with somebody. Helps their society, helps their democracy, and sometimes it just helps us be better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. We will be back tomorrow as we head to BC, to the town of Princeton, British Columbia, where we're sitting down with Mayor Spencer Coyne. So tune in for that interview. Until then, just keep talking.